and my slides will return to me. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, my name is Neil Desai, and I've been doing InfoSec since about 2000. 95% um, defense, and the opinions in this are my own, not my employers, not my friends, anyone else's. Um, if any of you guys remember high school teachers that said, if I say it once, think about it. If I say it twice, really worry about it. If I say it three times or more, it's on the test. How many people have said, what we're not doing is splitting atoms. What we're doing is basic. How many times have you heard that in this room today? I know at least two speakers in this room that have said it. I'm going to say it for the third time because it's on the test. We're not splitting atoms. Why am I repeating this? Because I've been doing this, I said, since 2000. I've been doing consulting for about five years, and I see the companies making the exact same mistakes all the time. Now, they want to do the cool stuff. They want to do what's sexy. They want to do what's new, but they can't get right the old. And so we kind of need to look at that. And by the way, uh, I pity the fool that doesn't like my presentation. This is... I guess when I get into my CTF hacking mode, I kind of look angry, and so one of my friends put this together for me. So I had to put it up there for him. So every, the big buzzwords now, right? Everyone wants to do algorithms, data structure, machine learning. We want to do AI. We want to look at large amounts of data. We want to do different things with large amounts of data. Petabytes of data, all different sizes of data, Hadoop, whatever it is, this is the big thing, but unfortunately, we're all doing it to find these guys at the end, right? It's pretty much just North Koreans, and I like it because he's using a pair of binoculars here. I'm not exactly sure how he's going to use the binoculars to look at his laptop. Uh, I noticed everyone's laughing, but then I realized that this week, I don't know if you heard about the story, uh, supposedly one guy in North Korea fell asleep in a meeting and was executed for it. So now we know why everyone's laughing because they're told to laugh. Um, or you might be looking for this guy, um, and I don't know why all the hackers always have to wear. Who are the red teamers in here? I know there's some red teamers still. Do you dress like this? Are you sure? I mean, I try typing with gloves like this, and it just doesn't work very well. Um, and in the end, when you don't find anything, this is what your attackers are doing. They're just laughing because they did the simplest things to get in your network, to get the data, and get out of your network. They're not trying hard. I hate to tell you the word zero day and APT is the marketing speak for we suck, but we don't want to admit it. So we might want to call it advanced. And that's how they got in because they're really smart. They're not smart. Well, they may be smart, but they're not using smart tactics to get in. They're doing the same things over and over again. And at this point, you might as well just buy these dice from attrition.org to figure out how to properly attribute your attacks. You can just buy them and it'll tell you backdoor what exploit, who did it. It's great stuff because that's about what you really have when you don't have good data. Um, I'm not a scientist, but so I understand like LIFO, right? Last in, first out. FIFO, first in, first out. Then there's a new one, CICO, crap in, crap out. Now, funny enough, if you pronounce it, it also pronounces CISO. I'm not going to say anything about that, but take it as you will. So here we kind of have the timeline. So I'm giving just a little bit of history of how we got to where we are today. And you can kind of see the breakdown of things. Um, so this is my awesome timeline. And unfortunately, it says, in the beginning, really small. And we have Utopia which, by the way, is never, ever going to happen. So it's kind of like that graph in math that you get as close to the line, but you never actually touch the line. That's kind of information security. And we're somewhere on that line. We are here. Um, so around 1986 is when all these things majorly started. You had your firewalls. You had your antivirus starting up. Um, you had your vulnerability scanners coming out, your network intrusion detection systems. And it's not that operating system logs came out then, but people started to use operating system logs more for security than just basic accounting. They were starting to look at various attacks, different types of events that were happening to determine if good was happening or bad was happening. Uh, the SIEM, which is your security information event management, pretty much take logs from a bunch of different systems and put them into one central area and unify how they look. So that way, if I look at a Cisco log, it looks like a checkpoint log. It somewhat looks like a Microsoft log or a Syslog from a Unix box. 
You have your network-based anomaly detection looking at your flows, your web application firewalls, and now we've got threat intelligence rolling in. And then this is NG and then any string of letters and numbers you want after that, because that's how people name their products, right? You have uh, Checkpoint NG. Every version of the next thing is called NG. I guess that's next generation. So, And where we are today, everyone wants, like I said, the big data, the analytics, the machine learning stuff. Uh, and by the way, this is not really to scale, and it's not really accurate in historical terms, but it's what I'm using. So the problem we start out with, not all logs are created equal. And we can't treat them as that they're all created equal. You can't say that the Microsoft operating logs, like the security logs, is equal to a system log, is equal to an application log, that any of those are any way related to syslog on a Unix box. Turning on full logging does not make the situation better. I've had many companies kill their solutions because they said, let's turn it all on and let another vendor product figure it out. And what happens is the other vendor product tanks because there's a limitation on storage. More logs does not equal better analysis. If you were here for the previous talk, you know the guys talked about the pain points that people have when they have too much to look through. They need better visualization to kind of piece these things, to tear them apart, to see their way through what they're doing. And we need to understand the log source. So how many of you guys in here doing defense actually implemented the end technology? You personally implemented the firewall or the IDS or the IPS or the web application. And how many of you have inherited that from either a predecessor or some other group did that for you and you just are the end receiver of the devices? So how many are in the first group where you kind of did everything? You know exactly what it's set up like. You went, you put it there, you know everything about that device. Most people don't fall into that category. Most people fall into the, I now I'm in the job and my predecessor before got it. Well, who got it before him? Well, the guy that was bought for him. And so it's just kind of this thing that's passed on forever and we don't really know what it's giving us. We don't know how it's giving us anything. And this was used before the trust, but verify, uh, I don't want to tell any of my people I'm working with or for that they're lying to me, but I can't exactly trust what they're saying either. So first thing is how do we know we're monitoring all of our devices that we're supposed to monitor? I've gone into a client says we're have so many active directory servers. Great. Well, how did you get your list? Well, the system administrators gave us a list. How old is that list? I don't know. How do you verify that that is the actual number of domain controllers sitting in your environment today? Well, they gave us a list. Oh, yeah, you're not understanding my problem when, you know, we got to find there's a better way to get that information out there. Did anyone validate the sources from that list? Or do they just take that list as the gospel and they start implementing and start getting logs from those systems and expecting all of that to work? And do that you regularly check to see if they still work? I was working with a client recently and of the upwards of 1,000 domain controllers that were on a list, there were less than 1,000 that were actually running in production. But the list was 1,200. I decided to ask Active Directory because I figured Active Directory would lie a lot less to me about what it's running and who's running what and what the names of everything are and the IP addresses. And it was just a simple thing. It wasn't anything hard, just some PowerShell scripts. And how many different sources do you use to gather the same information? So in one other talk, they talked about asset management. You know, how do you get all your server lists? Is it just your sys admin say, we dumped everything that we bought from Microsoft and here's everything that has a Windows server license applied to it? Do you use asset management tools to validate that? Do you use your vulnerability assessment tools to validate that? Do you have access to the IP address database to understand what addresses have been allocated out and who they've been allocated out to? The more things you have pointing to the same answer, the more truth there is to that answer, if that makes sense. 
So again, we have the asset management tools, vulnerability scanners, flow data. If you're in talk over there, I love getting flow data. Um, worked at a company. It was interesting. The networking guys, for some reason, didn't like the security guys. And I think that's just about every company I've gone to. There's always this fight here. And the network guys would say, these are all the subnets that we have. I'm like, great. So I import all those subnets into my other tools and I get flow data. And all of a sudden my flow data is telling me about subnets that I don't have listed anywhere. But the engineers swore up and down to me that we gave you everything. And you should have seen the look in their faces when I said, what about this one? What about this one? It also turned out that with the flow data, we could see services that were getting turned on at night that were not on during the day when we did our scans. They knew when we did our vulnerability scans and then they would just change when they turned on services they knew they didn't want us to find. Flow data didn't lie. Flow data told us what was running when. And I guess PowerShell scripts, go into your Active Directory servers and say, what are the domain controllers? What versions of operating system are you running? What is your mode of operation? All these things you can gather. You can gather all of your server lists. You can gather your workstations. You want to find out how many users you have? Ask PowerShell to go grab it for you. You can dump out all the information. You can find out when someone last logged on. There's many things we can do in an automated fashion to gather as opposed to asking someone for a list. You got the physical planning guys. This was more true back in the day when a separate group went and racked and stacked everything for you. Now in the days of virtual where people just spin up VMs and shut them down and move them to different servers from like dev to UAT to production. It's a little bit harder to track but they might be able to give you a little bit of help to figure out what's where. All we're really trying to do is get multiple sources of information to tell us what do we own so we know what are we supposed to really be monitoring. Do you know all the ingress and egress points out of your network? And I'm not talking about the internet points. Any way to get into your network and out of your network. You have B2B links probably. Do you have any links with companies who do customized troubleshooting for you that they have a specific way to get into your environment? Does anyone still have any old school modems that someone can dial into to hop into your network? There are many different ways to get in and you have to think, what are all of those ways? Because you need to know, how do you exfiltrate data? So the first time this really hit me is back when the first worms really came out, they were the, uh, the code red coming out you know, for web stuff. And so our developer said, we don't need to patch development stuff. You only need to patch things that are facing on the internet. And at the time, it seemed like a pretty good idea. Only patch things that could get hit from the internet. So we didn't patch anything on the inside of our network. Well, the problem is Code Red came in through a vendor over our B2B link and then hit us from the backside. I had enough alerts in my IDS that unfortunately went to my email. I had to go to the exchange administrators to delete all my emails because Outlook wouldn't open. I had over 8,000 emails. Um, so we want to look where, how can we go everywhere? Because we have to understand if someone's exfiltrating data from us, how did they get in? Where are they taking it out? Simply saying they're taking it out the internet may not be right. I think I heard, was it uh, Target actually got hit through some other third party vendor that did some type of air conditioning? So who knows that the data actually left Target's proxy? How do you know it didn't go back over that B2B link and out of that other air conditioning network? We have no idea. But if you're only looking this way, you're not going to see what happens every other way out there. Firewall logs are overrated. And I know auditors are going to probably kill me. Someone probably wants to throw their phone at me or maybe someone next to them's phone at me. But listen to me for just a second about firewall logs and why they're not as valuable as you think. Do you have access to your firewall rules? If you don't have access to your rules and you haven't reviewed your rules, how useful are the logs? Because you don't know what logging was turned on. You don't know, is that rule useful or not? You don't know if the logging got turned on, and I'm guilty of this myself, you're troubleshooting connectivity for an application, so you create a firewall rule for that application and you turn on logging. Just so you can tell the developer, I see the traffic going across the firewall, it's not my problem. And then you're supposed to delete that rule and you kind of forget. And in the meantime, that, log, that rule is just spitting out log after log after log for every transaction. 
if you don't know what logs are there, if you don't know the rule set to me, firewall rules are just, they're junk. Do they filter out anything in the firewall? Back in the day, you know, people used to port scan. Again, you red, guy, red team guys. How often do you sit there and port scan someone's internet facing environment anymore? I mean, do you really sit there and just go, I'm gonna nmap scan your DMZ? Or is it easier, you know, I'm just gonna send a phishing email because that's much simpler to hit a user than it is to break into a DMZ, then break out of a DMZ into the... People don't do this anymore. But unfortunately, people have this old mindset that, you know, oh, they're gonna break into my firewall. In my 15 years of doing this, the only decent exploit I saw was an old checkpoint firewall thing back in like early 2000. Beyond that, I have yet to see anyone have a firewall exploit that gives them full access past the firewall. They don't need to. You gave them port 80. They took port 80. They went and did what they would to the web server. No one attacks the firewall. I don't know who started that crazy thing. But someone started, you know, people, hackers attack firewalls and you have to have different types of firewalls because in case they get past the first one, they won't get past your second one. Well, if port 80 is open on both, they're going to get past both because you let them. But anyway, for me, firewall logs aren't that great. Um, again, back when scanning was big, they were kind of useful, but then worms came out and they just started blasting MSRPC, you know, TCP 135, 139, 445 all over the internet. So now I can't distinguish between someone who's actually trying to attack me and a worm that's just doing mass scans of the entire internet. The logging was bad enough, it actually almost took down my checkpoint management system with log data. So instead of the last rule being drop any, any log, we had drop any, any Microsoft SQL, Microsoft RPC, SNMP, certain things that were just too high, drop it and don't log it because there's so much of it going on that I can't make sense of it. I cannot make heads or tails of a good guy and a bad guy just because of the amount of volume. But again, if you don't have access to the rules and not just a snapshot, because we know firewall rules change. If you don't have real time access to the rules, if you don't understand the rules, the logs to me are worthless. Does anyone review the logs or the rules before they're put in? Is there anyone in the security team that's a part of it that has a yay or nay say in the firewall rule process? Do they review it? Do they know what's going on to say, this is a good rule, this is a bad rule, or hey, if you create this rule, it will effectively undo a rule that's later on. This is something I've seen before where rules negate. Firewalls are first match wins. And how many times something's put in for troubleshooting or there's so many layers of abstractions in the firewall uh, methodology where they have a group. And so instead of assigning two IPs, they put IPs in a group and then they put a group in the rule. So group A can get to group B for port 80. But next thing you know, they create another group that has a different set of rules and they start applying the rules to that and it could negate something below there. Again, monitoring the rules to the firewall. This is a pain to get involved in because unfortunately it puts you in the middle of a business process. But again, if you want your logs to be useful, you have to understand what they're going to do. And again, we talked about the rules removed for troubleshooting. So where's your IDS placed? Someone's gonna say the perimeter, okay. Is it inside the firewall or outside the firewall? Is it surrounding the firewall? Is it on all three interfaces? Do you know what your DMZ looks like? Do you know how many IDSs are on your DMZ? And most people don't. Like I said, I do 95% defensive work, but every now and then I get fun, some fun and get to do some offensive work. And I was doing a consulting gig with my friend and I got to do a pen test. He's like, okay, cool. You're gonna come in and this is a bank in West Virginia. So I started talking to them. They said, well, we have an MSSP. I'm like, what do they do for you? They monitor all of our traffic. They have an IDS and any time we get attacked, they give us an alert. Okay, cool. So how many alerts do you get? Oh, we don't get any. Okay. So like how, what would I have to do to trigger an alert? Oh, you, you try anything to us and we're going to get an alert. Okay. Nmap dash a, do you know what that means? 
aggressive mode means do not be nice. Do not play well with other children, kick everyone around. So I should have set alarms off all over the place. Next morning, come in. Hey, did you guys get any emails? No. Okay. Well, let's call the MSSP. Did you guys see anything? Nope. We saw absolutely nothing. Okay. So I scanned the junk out of you over and over again for about four hours and you saw nothing. Nope. Is the IDS up? Oh well, yeah. I mean, you know, we would have gotten alert. Where's the IDS? All right. We're going to go, let's take a trip. Let's take a field trip. We went looking for the IDS on the customer premise and guess where we found it. Yep. Storage closet, not plugged into anything. They'd been paying, I think it was like 3000 plus a month for this service for how many months. And no one even knows when it was unplugged and put away in a storage closet. But the MSSP swore that you get hacked. We will know and we'll notify you about it. So really where's your NIDS placed? Do you really honestly know where it's placed? Can you go physically take a look at it? Can someone go take a picture and say, yes, we know exactly where it is. We know what it's doing. Again, are they around your firewalls or not? Because that's going to make a big difference as what type of traffic you're going to see. It makes a difference on how you can configure it. It makes a difference in how you can tune things because you can make assumptions uh, the right way then. Does our policy reflect the firewall policy? And what I mean by this is if your firewall doesn't allow FTP, I can turn on every FTP rule and have very little performance hit, but know that as soon as I get an FTP hit, someone has modified the firewall rule. If I'm not supposed to have SNMP out, or if we understand certain type of traffic is not supposed to go through there and I'm monitoring, for me, it's okay to turn on every rule for that just to see, is anyone allowing that to go through? Does that make sense? Are they monitoring specific networks or resources, or are they just there monitoring everything that it sees? Because it's on a specific interface, it's in between a bunch of things, but has it been given a task? I had nine different IDSs, had 36 different interfaces, 36 different policies, because each interface was on a separate network and each network was only going to monitor for one specific thing. I didn't want to get five or 10 different alerts for one attack. I wanted to know where the attack was really going to. Again, do you get multiple IDS alerts for the same thing? Now, how's traffic getting to your IDS? Span port, tap, layer seven switch. Do you actually know, can you verify it? Do you have a configuration? Do you have a diagram, a picture, something showing you how you actually get traffic? Now, most times companies have HA, they've got redundant firewalls, they've got redundant routers. If you're off a span port or you're on a tap, are you getting all of the systems? Because there's a chance that if one of those systems goes offline or they fail over to another system, you could lose monitoring ability. But you wouldn't know it because your interface will still say up because it's technically connected at a physical level. You just won't see any traffic. How many people I've seen that have kind of got bitten by that one? Are you overflowing a port with too much data? Worked at a very, very, very large financial company. They had a one gigabit port coming in to a 100 megabit IDS. And they wondered why it didn't work very well. It was simple. You have too much data going to it. They didn't want to hear that. Like I can't help the science of it. You have 1000 going in 100 going out. You're losing 900 somewhere. So people solve this in different ways. One of the ways they try and do is load balancing. Well, the problem with IDS is, is they have to understand the full state of the connection, the TCP state, sometimes the HTTP state, they have to be really aware of everything where when you're load balancing, they just want to make sure that you're getting equal amounts of data going across to everyone. But the problem is in doing so, they can break the connection to create that ability and effectively rendering your IDS less than useless. So are you getting full sessions? 
Are you seeing the full protocol? Are you getting all the TCP that's going there? Can you do a check with Wireshark or some sniffer and see, am I getting everything that I expect to get on that specific port? Now, how many people have actually done that with their IDSs? Not many. So are there different loggings uh, devices giving you the same information. So in this example, you've got a firewall log saying that I went to port 80. You got a proxy log saying that I went to Google and you have flow data saying that I have port 80 traffic as well. Which one of those has more data? Because the firewall is just going to tell me ports and uh, IP addresses. Flow data is going to give me probably at least amount of data that was transmitted in the time. But proxy is going to also give you the full URL. It's going to tell me what HTTP version I was using. It's going to give me a lot more data than the other two. So why do I want to keep a firewall record, a proxy record, and a flow record when they all tell me the same thing? Who's going to give me the most data? The proxy. So in that case, I would not get that particular firewall log. Either I would turn it off at the firewall or in your SIM or whatever else, drop those specific logs. And same with the flow data. There's no reason for me to get more data about the same thing, especially if one is far superior in the amount of detail it gives you. Are you filtering out useless events? If you've done Microsoft logging, I do enjoy their logging. This is not a crack on Microsoft. However, there are quite a few logs in there that are very useless. System resource was accessed. What resource? A system one. Oh, thank you. Um, and it gives you a lot of those. Okay. Unfortunately, you may not be able to turn that off, but you can filter it. So you're not having to sift through it later. Um, eventually you're going to kill your system with useless events and it's going to be a lot harder to deal with. Also, when you're doing forensics and stuff like that, you don't want to say, give me everything from this specific IP. If 90% of those events from that IP are useless. Do you get alerts when policy changes? Someone changes your Windows policy. There's an event written for that. Do you actually get an alert that lets you know so you can take action? Someone changes a Cisco configuration on a router. It's written. Firewall changes. There's always an entry somewhere that says, hey, an update was made. But who deals with that when an update was made? Who goes and sees what that update was? Was it an authorized update? Unauthorized update? Who made the change? Is there change control for that? Or do we just go, meh, an update was made. Or most people don't even realize that they could monitor that an update was made. Do you monitor for lack of events from a device? Work with a customer that had 50 servers. I'm like, yep, cool. I'm like, how do you know you're getting logs from all 50? Because we entered them in the system. So I know we're getting logs from all 50. All right, please bear with me. Let me go and prove to myself that we're getting logs from all 50. We got logs from 36 of the 50. They just assumed because they put it in the system that it worked. They never troubleshot. They never said, okay, I put in server A. Take a pause. Let me see. Do I have logs from server A? Yes. Now let me check server A off. Let me go to server B. Turn server B's logs on. Yes, I'm getting logs from server B. That takes way too much time. It's easier to put server A, B, C, D, E, F, G all the way through and just say, I got them all. Unfortunately, that's not due diligence. And let me tell you, when you're doing incident response, the last thing your boss is going to want to hear is, we really don't have logs from that system. Uh, we thought we did, but we kind of don't. That's not going to fly very well. So take the time up front to make sure that you're getting everything you think you're supposed to be getting. So most people probably don't maintain their own security devices. So do you have an actual SLA to get something back online and monitoring? If not, what do you do with the outage? When your IDS goes offline that's monitoring your internet connection, do you just twiddle your thumbs and go, oh, well, I guess we better call somebody and hope somebody can get it fixed. And because it's not defined, that somebody is very nebulous. So there's maybe a group you contact, maybe there's a phone number, maybe there's an email, 
but there's no specific person that you're going after to say, Hey, I lost a security device. You have X amount of hours or days to get it back online. And if you don't, I'm going to escalate this to your boss because without that, you're going to be going blind because no one's accountable for when it comes back. No one really cares because it's not theirs. Most people probably don't maintain their own devices. They have another group that maintains it. So how do you know when a sysadmin makes a change to your device? How do you know that they didn't change some type of policy on there? How do you know they didn't break something by enabling a Windows firewall or IP tables that just block port access on your device? Unless you have access to everything on there and you run everything, you won't know what's going on. And if you run everything, there's a good chance you're not sitting here because you're too busy running everything. And how often do you test your alerting and response mechanism? So we set it up. We know on today, my IDS is getting the right things it's supposed to get. Server A is sending me the logs it's supposed to send. How do you know that somewhere in the middle, an upgrade didn't happen, a config got changed, no one's malicious, but something happened, and you're no longer getting traffic to your IDS? You're no longer getting all the logs from server A. How do you know? By everyone staring at me blank, it's just like, oh, well, we don't know. You got to do some type of systematic testing every so often to test. Yes, I know that I'm getting logs from that device. They're the logs I expect. Everything's happening exactly as we designed it to. And I can see from when I attacked all the way through. Now, it is a pain in the rear. I'm not going to say it's not. We had it to the point where one of our analysts would have to take one day off every six weeks, take his laptop into the server room and plug into different parts of the network because that's the only way he could generate traffic to trigger IDS alerts for specific interfaces. But we made it easy because in the alert, we did a simple, you know, get request for Etsy password. Man, that's old. I don't think anyone's doing Etsy password attacks anymore. But what we did is in the URL, he put his user ID, he put the network segment he was on, followed by Etsy password. So when we got the alert and it triggered, and we're like, oh, we got an Etsy password attack. Hey, well, Sean did it on this specific network. Now look at the alert. Did the alert match that interface on that IDS? Or did a different IDS report it? We're able to trace it back to understand to make sure that everything is working as we expect it to, because it can. If I'm not getting the right data, how are you going to do your learning algorithms and all these things that I can't even pronounce on the data. If I can't even get you the right data, what are you really going to learn? What are you really going to find? Like I said, a lot of data doesn't mean good data. So how do you deal with the actual alerts when they come out? What do most people do? And if you have something in your hand, I suggest you put it down now because I don't want someone to throw things at me because the next two points I have are going to make you scream, yell at me, uh, yell vulgarities and other things. Um, and just bear with me, at least of the two, we can discuss them in an adult fashion afterward over beer. Uh, hopefully after you've had a few beers so you can understand better what I'm saying. Um, emails, I hate them. You're like, oh, but we know now. You're right. And then people create an outlook rule to delete it because they don't want to see the emails anymore. Not many people respond to emails. They get overwhelmed with emails. That's all they see emails, whether it's email for a meeting, change to a meeting, update to a meeting, project, phone, spam, whatever it is, people don't look at their emails. So sending this via email is not going to help people do any better. We're conditioning them to have a bad response. I forget, I was talking to someone in the speaker's lounge and, you know, we talked about how security were part of the problem. Think about every vendor appliance you own. When you connect to it with a web browser, what does it tell you to do? This has a bad certificate. Do you still want to view the website? And we click OK. We're enabling, we're giving users a bad experience. Why can't vendors just go spend a couple of hundred bucks, get a real cert from RSA and put it on the box. So everyone has a real certificate instead of self-signed certs that are not recognized by anyone anywhere. So in the same way here, we're building bad behavior. They hate their email already. So if they're conditioned to hate email, why are we giving it to them in this format? 
And this is the kicker here. I hate reports. I hate reports. One, they tell me what happened in a period of time ago. Doesn't do me much good for now. Two, honestly, do you actually look at your report in detail when you get it? Do you go line by line through everything that says failed login and investigate it? Of course you don't. Why would you? And let's say you do. You're one of that like 0.1% of 0.1%. Where do you document it? Where do you say, I opened up the PDF, line one, this user attacked this user. I investigated it. Here's everything I found and it was a non-issue. You don't. Why do you get reports? Because you feel good. Because PCI tells us we need to have reports. Because management wants to see pie charts and they want to see graphs and they want to see pretty colors. But they're useless. They don't help you do anything real. And it's so bad I made him leave. Um, so one of the things that people have to do is how much security knowledge do the analysts actually possess? I've been in a couple of different customers where the people who are working in security, this might be their first IT job. They may have come from compliance. They may come from something else that's labeled as security, but they really don't have any security knowledge. Well, that doesn't do you any good if you're in the security realm and you don't have security knowledge. Now think about this. Imagine going to a doctor for surgery and they just decide, well, he is a podiatrist, but he's going to do your heart surgery. You know, he's a doctor, right? I mean, he, he went to medical school. We don't accept it in other areas, but for some reason in the IT area, we think everyone is interchangeable. We think it's just like you take this person out, you pop another one in and it's all good to go. And that's not true. Packet analysis does not mean I know how to use Wireshark and I right click and I do view TCP stream. That is not packet analysis. Wireshark is a nice tool, but Wireshark was intended for networking people, not security people. It's intended to troubleshoot network related issues, not security related issues. If you can't use TCP dump, if you can't look at the hex values in the packets, you're not doing packet analysis. What you're doing is, oh man, can I quick at this look and figure out is something good or bad? Yay or nay. If you can't look at the ASCII on the side and the hex and Wireshark and, and understand what they are independent of each other, you're not doing analysis. Because in Wireshark, it puts a little dot when it can't translate a hex value. Well, guess what? You need that hex value. If you're looking at shell code coming across the wire, it's just going to show you dots on the right hand side for the ASCII because there is no ASCII for it. So if you're not reading the hex, you're not doing packet analysis. How many languages do they actually know? I'm not talking about talking language, scripting language, compiled languages. You see a web attack come across, you see a JavaScript file downloaded. That JavaScript is heavily encoded. What do you do? Yeah, everyone stares at everyone else. Why? Because they don't even know where to start to look at how do I start decoding this JavaScript? Because guess what? People encode JavaScript files and they're legitimate. They don't want other people to steal their logic. Bad people do it for the same reason, but their logic just has more evil intentions. But if you don't know how to decode this stuff, if you can't figure out what's going on, what use are you? I'm not trying to be harsh about it, but it just, when I see analysts out there that don't have the necessary skill sets, I'm wondering what value are you providing to the environment? All the tools that everyone talks about here is useless if you don't know what you're doing. Their job for the tools is to make you better. Their job isn't to make you be able to do basic work. So if you've seen war games, you remember this line, do you want to play a game? Well, yes, you do want to play a game. You want to play CTF style games. You want you and your coworkers and your boss, not your immediate family though, to play games. Because these are not ordinary games. 
these games are going to challenge your ability to think on the fly. They're going to challenge the way you solve problems. Here are things that a game will give you that you're not going to find anywhere else. You have a time limit. Guess what? When you're doing incident response, you have a time limit. You want to be under pressure? Yeah, go up against another team for points. You'll start to feel pressure. How many times you go in to do incident response, you're dealing with something you've never seen before. Welcome to a real CTF. Here's a binary created specifically for this uh, test only, for this competition only. Reverse it, defend it, patch it, safeguard it, figure it out. It's not about what tool you bring to the table. It's about the skills you bring to the table. Back when I did CTFs, gosh, 10 years ago, Ken Shoto was very adamant. We don't care what tool you bring to CTF. If that's all you have, you will lose. You better know C. You better know assembly. You better know all these things. You, better, you have to think on the fly to solve the challenges. If you can't, you're not going to do very well. The scoring system our first year was an old school phone that you had to remember the old AT&T dial codes on your modem to dial their system and then punch in the right numbers um, after you got in to submit your phone record or your keys for scoring. A lot of the new kids had never worked on a modem before. They had no idea what to do. They're like, what do you mean modem codes? What are we doing for AT&T strings? You get all sorts of challenges that you have to really think outside the box. And to me, it's a great space, one, to learn. Two, you get to build a team out of that because it's no longer just, you know, I work a day job, you work a day job, she works a day job. We get together afterward and we work on challenges. We foster more of a team environment. You're going to learn a lot from it. Learn the offensive side to make your defensive side better. So we all saw these red team guys who were here before me, right? And they talked about, oh, here's how I attack X. Here's how I broke into this company. Don't just read their slides. Don't go just watch their presentations on Iron Geek afterward. Go repeat what they did on your network, with permission, of course. But don't just say, oh, yeah, I heard about Mimicats. Yeah, this guy used Mimicats to go do this cool thing. Go download Mimicats. Go put it on one of your workstations. How does it work? Can you even run it? Once you run it, does it leave any trace behind or any alarms set off or en is anything set off by it? Yes or no. If not, hmm, maybe you want to look at what can you do to turn things on to find it. You'll start to understand things more and understand how people move around and what goes on when you do the work yourself. Some people call it reinventing the wheel. But the thing is, if you haven't done it before, you're not really necessarily reinventing because you don't have enough knowledge of it yourself. That really hit me when I first started learning writing buffer overflows. I'd read a lot of PDFs, like Travis Goodspeed said, you know, I read the frack article, you know, how to smash stacks for fun and profit. I read the art of exploitation, the first book. I don't know how many different things I had read. So this should have been a relatively easy task for me to do on a system that has zero protection. And it was a basic thing. It was taking just, you know, the first argument from the command line, throwing it into 256 fight, byte buffer, no bounds checking anything. Should be super simple, right? Like half an hour max. And that's even really bad time. No, it took like four days. And I was very, very humbled by that experience because I'm like, really? Reading everything did not prepare me for what needed to be done. Yeah, I knew the commands, but I'd never done them myself. After I wrote my first one, uh, the second one was significantly simpler. Then when I went over to uh, format strings, first one again was hard. Second one was much simpler. So it wasn't until I started actually doing the activities and doing the various tasks that I got to see what was involved in doing it. It also helps you know how worried do you really need to be about something. Because today, how many times, you know, now they joke around on, Twitter about how the latest exploit, not only does it get a cute name, it gets a website and it gets a logo. And as soon as it hits CNN, you know, your C level executive is going to be on you the next day about this new attack. Oh, what are we doing about it? They don't know anything about it. All they know is their friends are worried about it. So they need to be worried about it because they're, if they're not worried about it, they don't look good. 
but you need to be able to say, well, I've analyzed this and from what I understand about the exploit, from what I understand about the target, from what I understand all these things, we don't have that much to worry about, or here are the defenses we have in place to monitor for it, or here are the things we have in place to prevent it from happening. You don't want to just go off someone else's write-up. Yes, they're going to have the technical information, but they don't know your environment. They don't know what you guys have in place, how you're configured. Again, don't just watch other people. Please go do it yourself. Have fun doing it. If you don't want to do it on your network, at least get VMware. That way, after you blow it up, you can just redo it really quickly. Uh, my thing is, after you create your first VM image, save state. And that way, after you blow it up, you just revert to state instead of having to rebuild it every single time. Very easy, very clean. Every stage, you can save state on a next stage of an exploit or next stage of something you're trying, and you can always go back without having to rebuild your entire system. It's not always about process. And this is one of the things that are frustrating me is managers think that they can make security a process. Just do these things and you'll make us secure. No, I won't. I worked at a bank and they were huge on Six Sigma. They wanted to Six Sigma everything. And they came to me and says, we want you to create a, Sig a green belt Six Sigma process for incident response. Okay, you get the attackers to agree to a Six Sigma process of when they're gonna attack me. Then I can create the Six Sigma response of how I plan on dealing with their attack. But until I know when they're gonna attack, how they're gonna attack, what they're going to do, how do I quantify that? Because Six Sigma is all about repeatable processes. Well, I don't control the biggest part of my issue, the guys that attack me. You need to be able to think outside the box, think about different things. Again, critical thinking. This is why I love the CTF challenges and not the defensive ones. The defensive ones are okay, but you realize after a while, they're fairly easy to deal with because no one's dropping zero days there. When you get to a DEF CON style CTF, Plaid CTF, Pico CTF, any one of the major ones, they're writing custom services, binaries, forensics, um, web challenges. Everything is designed for that competition. So you're not going to be able to Google a solution. You're not going to be able to find someone who knows how to solve it. They've made the challenges esoteric because they want to push your understanding of technology, your understanding of a problem and see how much do you really know? Can you really figure it out? We're not going to make anything easy. need to understand operating system, networks, programming, all these different things. How many people come into security now with a degree from college, but never have done any of these things? How many people come out, you know, I want to do security. The thing I kind of got lucky is when I started in security, there was no security, but I'd done network engineering, network analysis, PC building, PC troubleshooting. So when I got to do my first security job, I had a good background to understand, okay, here's how I secure something because I've already built it before. I've been a server admin. So I know what server admins do. Okay, I've been a network engineer. I know what they do. Now I can secure it. But if you come in straight out of college, you have zero to no IT experience, what do you plan on securing? All you're going to do is follow someone else's documentation with no rhyme or reason. You're not going to understand what you're doing or why you're doing it. So these are to me, the basic things that are needed for people to do better at security to take it. Once they get this, then you'll have the right data that you need. You'll have the right information you need for those PhDs to do all their algorithms and their wizard tree on your logs to find all sorts of cool stuff. But if we can't get this stuff right, and it's 2015 and companies are still getting it wrong. What hope do you have of doing the future stuff? What hope do you have of doing the esoteric things, the things that sound really cool? Does anyone have any questions about this? Besides I'm wrong in certain areas, as far as you're concerned. We got to figure out why do they hate us? We got to figure out what did we do to make them so mad? 
It's obviously our fault. We then, then we did something wrong. Then we did something wrong. So I, the first environment I went to, there was a guy there and he had two hackers. And all he did is his guys would break into IT systems. He would make a big stink to the CTO about how bad IT was because he rooted every box, but he didn't tell anyone how to fix anything. And so when we came in, everyone assumed that we were like him. And so we already had this negative vibe going towards us. And I had to go to everyone and say, one, I'm not with this guy. Okay, two, I found something. I'm not saying it to everyone yet. What's going on here? Oh, well, we needed to do this job. Okay, well, can we figure out a better way to do that job? Let's enable them to do it in a better way instead of just beating them with a stick. Let's help them say, hey, I've got solutions for you. Or you might find out that unfortunately, the way that they're doing it is the only way possible, as bad as it is. And then you just have to write that up as a risk saying, hey, we found it. These guys aren't in trouble because unfortunately, this is the only possible way to do this particular thing. But I think too many times security people come in with a stick and want to beat everyone up. And we give ourselves a bad name because we're out there with this tough guy kind of beating up everyone attitude. And we don't understand this is a business. They need to operate, whether they're the business, whether they're IT, they have a job to do. If we want their help, let's help them do their job. When I was doing it at a financial company, one of the ways I helped IT is, so we have a SOX requirement to keep logs. They're like, yep. I'm like, do you like keeping the logs? They're like, no. I'm like, in every couple of months, a, an auditor comes in and says, we want to do an audit. And what does that mean to you? We have to take our best sysadmin away from being a sysadmin to look through terabytes of syslog data to write a script to give them data. I said, what if I take away that all from you? Like what? I'm like, you give me your budget for storage every year. And anytime you have an audit issue around your logs, tell them to come see me. I made a bunch of friends. And once I did that with the Windows group, the Unix guys were knocking on my door. They went from being enemies to saying, hey, we really need him. But at the same time, I understood since I had the keys to the kingdom with all the logs, I did troubleshooting with them. That wasn't security related. But they would say, hey, this one account keeps locking out. What can you do? Hold on, let me go look at my logs. Hey, have you checked these three systems over here? Oh, we didn't know about those. Well, there's a good chance it's on there. But if we stay that we only do security and we don't help the various businesses out, to me, we do it to ourselves. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's just been my experience and how I've seen it happen. Other questions? No, that was inside. I just, I've been a consultant only for the last couple of years. This is when I worked at a financial company and we came in way after the fact um, to do security. So before that security was done, the networking guys did the network side. So they did the firewalls and the IDS. The server guys did whatever server guys do. The workstation guys did antivirus and whatever. So everyone's job was job first. If you have any extra time, look at security. But if not, don't worry about it because it's not really your job. And so when we showed up, we had to take an inventory of what did the system look like? And it was bad. It was really, really bad. And we made enemies along the way, but we also had to figure out who can we partner with. So the networking guys, we stayed enemies my entire six years there. Nothing I can do about that. The server guys, we ended up making friends with them and we were able to work with their engineering group, their operations group very well. Any other questions? I could give away for good questions. So I'll give one to the guy back there and there. I have to go find him. You're gonna make me walk, aren't you? Oh no, no. Oh, okay, you'll walk. Whoa, this is great. Yeah. So the people in the furthest back get these then if you're walking. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, the guy from I think it's the Tennessee ISSA guy asked a really good question, and then there's one guy next to him that asked a question about that works great in a consultancy, but not. So one there and all right. So no questions, any thoughts about anything? Like I said, I'm here till whenever having the dinner. We could talk about stuff offline if you don't want to bring up the dirty laundry of your company in public, <laughs> which is cool. Um, but if not, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for letting me speak here today.